Brian Holyfield here from uh, Gotham Digital Science. Um, just talking to uh, to Brian about uh, this uh, plugin uh, that they're uh, they've written for iOS 7 that does some pretty cool stuff with a uh, uh, combination of sort of WAF-like techniques and blacklisting. Uh, he's also going to talk about um, uh, he's going to talk about just uh, IS7 uh, uh, included sort of Microsoft included uh, techniques for for evading some sort of attack. So we had a talk on offense, and now we've got a talk on defense. So enjoy. All right. So as Chris said, today we're going to talk about IS7. The uh, the agenda is really just to give uh, a brief overview of IS7 and sort of a what's new. Uh, then talk about IS7 integrated mode, which is a new operating mode that IS7 has that really allows you to do some some much more powerful things than you could do uh, before, especially when we talk about applications that are not ASP.NET applications. And then we're going to spend a lot of time talking about IS7 modules. Um, specifically, we're going to talk about uh, some modules that come with IS7 that can sort of be used to do some application security type stuff. Uh, we're going to talk about some add-on modules that Microsoft has released since IS7 came out that are free that you can install on IS7. And then we're going to talk about how you can build your own custom module. And we've got a case study of a module uh, that we've written uh, that's called SPF that uh, does some, as Chris mentioned, some WAF type stuff um, at runtime. So we'll kind of run through that as well. So really the first thing to cover is what's new in IIS 7. And really the, the short answer is what's not new in IIS 7. Uh, those of you that have played around with IIS 7 or that are familiar with IIS 6 and 5 and so forth, um, IIS 7 is a complete redesign, complete rewrite of the entire web server top to bottom. Um, it is completely modular, so they have taken a page, so to speak, out of the Apache playbook and made the web server completely modular where every single piece of functionality corresponds to a module that you can install or uninstall as needed, depending on what you're using the server for. The other thing that they've done is they've done completely away with the whole concept of having an IIS metabase. So those of you familiar with previous versions of IIS know that there was a metabase file that was sort of like a registry ish type of data store where all the IIS, IIS configuration files uh, settings live. Uh, that's been done away with and all of the configuration files are now text based and a lot of them are moved straight into a web.config file. So even if an application is not a .NET application, uh, you can stick a web.config file into your web root and fine tune and tweak out the server settings that way. Another thing they've done which we're not going to talk about because it's not necessarily related to the topic at hand but they, they've introduced support for non-web or non-HTTP services. So when things like Windows Communication Foundation, which allow, uh, have bu built-in binary protocols for web services that are proprietary protocols that Microsoft has come up with, uh, you can actually host those in IIS7 as well. So it really extends beyond just HTTP-based services. So as far as security goes, um, just like those of you that, that remember when IIS6 first came out, and it had that default sort of lockdown mode compared to IIS 5, um, they've taken it again even further, and pretty much everything is off by default. You can't do anything other than stir serve static content. Chances are, if you've got an application, unless you actually start enabling some things, it won't run on IIS 7. They've also introduced the, uh, the concept of request filtering. Uh, there's a built-in request filtering module, which essentially is like URL scan. Uh, that is now built into IIS 7. And we'll talk a little bit about the uh, request filtering in a few minutes. So another thing to talk about is the operational modes that you can run IIS 7 in. So the new mode, which is called integrated mode, basically exposes the ASP.NET request pipeline to all applications. So those of you familiar with ASP.NET, you had its own, it basically ASP.NET has its own request pipeline with several events that you can hook into. Um, now that pipeline has been unified in IIS7 so that all applications have access to it. Now there is a backwards compatibility mode called compatibility mode um, that will allow you to run in the old style without integrated mode just for backwards compatibility. Some applications may break in the new integrated mode. 
But what it allows you to do is you, you, you have this collection of modules. They can be written in either native code or managed code. And those modules apply to all requests, whether or not they're actually .NET application requests or not. So previously, the concept of HTTP, HTTP modules is not new. It's been around for several years. Um, and .NET developers have used them for years to customize and extend and do some fun stuff with their applications. Well, now you can do the same thing. Any, any .NET module is basically now equivalent to an ISAPI filter. And it can apply to all requests as well. So what we're going to see here is that the combination of the modular design and the integrated pipeline basically allows us to do some really cool stuff and really ex it, it makes the web server very extensible. And that's hopefully what we're going to demonstrate here uh, today. So I mentioned before that um, every module ex basically has the ability to hook into one or more of these, these pipeline events on IIS 7. And just to give you an overview of sort of how the pipeline works and sort of how a typical request is processed when it's in integrated mode. Uh, you've got the user that essentially will make a request to IS7. And then the web server is going to then run through all of its different events and figure out which modules, if any, need to hook into the event and hand control over to that module. And then when they're done, it'll take control back. So the different events, there's about 23 events in all. And these, again, are not new. These are pretty much the same events that you've got in the .NET world that you can hook into with your global ASA file. The difference is now um, the web server modules can hook into these events. And you can really break them up into two categories. You've got your pre-execution events and your post-execution events. And in the middle is where the actual handler will execute and the, and the request will get processed by, let's say, the PHP DLL if it's a PHP request or the ASP DLL if it's a classic ASP request. So running through these, I'm not going to go through them, but they, they execute top to bottom in order. Um, once the pre-execution events are done, the basically middle, uh, it's not right in the middle, but essentially the middle request is process event, which is where the handler is going to execute. So at that point, control will be sent to the underlying handler, depending on the file type and the request type that's being um, issued. And then when the request is done, when the handler is done, it's going to then run through all of the post-execution events and give any of these modules the option to continue processing. So the nice thing about this is it allows the module to not only do stuff before the handler executes, but after. And that the main thing that you'd want to do after is uh, things like caching, output parsing, analyzing the response, all that stuff. And again, the, the list here, just for completeness, um, they go top to bottom. And, and then finally, at the end of the uh, pre-send request content event, uh, the content is then sent back to the user. So as we go through the, this is just a, a, an intro, because we're going to see this happen in a minute. But as we go through, there's going to be several examples and demos. And hopefully, the demo gods are on my side today, and, and nothing will go wrong. But we're going to be using a classic ASP application to do all of our demos. Uh, the reason we chose a classic ASP application is that, uh, like I said before, a lot of the stuff that you can do with these modules, you've always been able to do with .NET. Um, the, new th the, the, the new twist on it is the ability to, to do this stuff with other things, like PHP, classic ASP, et cetera. So the application that, uh, that I've selected here for our demo is an application called BattleBlog. It's a free open source blogging package that's written in classic ASP. And the reason it was picked is that it happens to be riddled with, with several common good security issues that make for great demos. So forced browsing to admin pages, cross-site request forgery, SQL injection, the whole nine yards. So we'll see that happen in a minute. But just so you know, going forward, that's, that's kind of the basis for the sample app and where it came from. And you can download it, and Google it, and find it um, online as well. I don't necessarily suggest using it, um, but certainly uh, it's good to play around with if you want to test for vulnerabilities and so forth. So the first thing I want to talk about is the built-in request filtering module that comes with IIS 7. So I mentioned before, this is basically URL scan that they've now just built into the web server. So it's a native module. It's written in C++. And essentially, it hooks in, going back to that, that event pipeline, it hooks into the begin request event. So it's one of the first uh, modules that get executed. And the reason for that, of course, is it's doing some security checks. So we, we want to catch those as quickly as possible and discard the request um, if there's anything wrong. 
So there's nothing really that new here that you didn't have with URL scan, so we're not going to spend too much time on it. But just to sort of reiterate, in case you're not familiar with URL scan, is that it's a really good filter for providing some generic protections. Um, it's now configurable at the application level, whereas before with IS6 and uh, previous, URL scan just had to be done sort of server-wide. Um, the, the, the problem is that from an app, app security perspective, it's not quite as flexible as we'll need it to be. So it's good for providing generic protections, but if you want to drill down and be granular as far as page level and parameter level validation, um, or even do things like regular expressions, it really doesn't support any of those. So it doesn't really give us the, the granularity that we're going to need to do some, um, some application level stuff, but it is a good general mechanism, and we'll see here in a minute that when you compare it to some of the other um, options that we've got, there are some things that it does that, that aren't very easy to do in, uh, in your own module. And I've got just the, uh, the command down here. Uh, the app CMD, which is sort of a command line interface for managing IS7, if you wanted to actually dump out, we can do that here, the, uh, the default configuration that comes with IS7 uh, for the request filtering module, you can just issue this command and it should dump the configuration out for us here. And we'll go over this in a second, but as I said before, all of the configuration now is text-based. So essentially what this is doing is it's basically dumping out the portion of the, uh, the web server configuration that applies to the request filtering module. And I'll just run through, before we go through the actual file, just to give you some background on the different options it's got. Um, this is just a quick summary. The, um, the first thing it'll allow you to do is prevent double encoded requests um, and also high bit character requests as well. I believe the, uh, both of these are, or the double encoded requests are uh, not permitted by default. The high bit characters are permitted by default. The, it'll allow you to also restrict file extensions by type. So um, you can specifically say, I want only these file extensions to be allowed, or I want all file extensions except these to be served. Um, as far as request limits go, it does some maximum tolerable levels for content length, URL length, and query string length. Um, it'll also allow you to control the verbs that are issued, so you can re restrict things like put, uh, options, that type of thing, only allow get and post. And then it's got the, uh, the deny URL sequences, which unfortunately doesn't support regular expressions. So um, those of you that, are, that, that use IIS and you had to maybe toy around with URL scan when the uh, AS Asprox and the other SQL injection worms came out. Uh, one of the things that, that a lot of people realized is that while it does support looking at query strings now, which is a great improvement over the, uh, the previous version, the newest URL scan they came out with, uh, it doesn't allow you to do regexes. So you need to have an exact string that you're, 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 you're rejecting, which is somewhat difficult when you're talking about attack strings. And then the last, port, the last option that it gives you is what they call hidden segments, which are basically just pieces of uh, virtual directories within the root that are not going to be permitted to, uh, for external users to request. So you can still have content in them, like the bin directory is a good example of that, um, where you can't issue any requests, get requests to it, but there are executable, there is executable content in there that the web server can run. So going back to the dump that we just did, you'll see that the default, and this is just the default uh, configuration that IIS will install with, it basically does not allow, uh, it, it allows any file extension to be served, so the allow unlisted is true, and then it specifically forbids all of these well-known file extensions that we know uh, typically IIS isn't going to want to serve up, like .config, uh, .cs, and so forth. Um, you can also see that the default hidden segments, again, there's no surprise there. It's got the, the web config in there, the bin directory, the app code directory. So these are all things that um, basically just comes pre-configured for a typical .NET app, but it is good to know that you can, ex you can configure this and fine tune this uh, if you have another application or other custom needs that you want to restrict it for. So. The, the, the better solution for a lot of the, the, the security-related stuff, um, or I should say the, the, the more flexible solution, uh, lies in some of these other modules that, uh, that the Microsoft team has released. So as I mentioned before, since IIS 7 first came out, and I think this is going to continue to be the trend, uh, the IIS team is now working on a series of just add-on modules that they release for free on IIS.net. 
So these modules do a bunch of different things. Most of them are not securely related, but there are a handful of them that do have potential security uses. Some of them are specifically intended for security. Other ones you can sort of uh, just c be creative and come up with ways to use them for security. So we'll run through a couple of those right now. Specifically, I want to talk about the dynamic IP restrictions module, the URL rewrite module, and the application request routing module. And again, these are written by Microsoft. Um, and they're free to install on IIS and download. So the first one is the dynamic IP restrictions uh, extension. And essentially what it allows you to do is, you know, in IIS you've always been able to block by IP address. Um, what this allows you to do is define intolerable or tolerable, depending on how you want to do it, thresholds, and then reject users if they violate those rules. So the, the specific attack here is some type of a denial of service attack that you want to prevent against. Um, so you can define a number of, a maximum number of concurrent requests or a maximum threshold of a number of requests over a period of time. And if anybody exceeds that, either by, you can, you can block them by domain name or by IP address, it'll automatically update the IIS config to block them for a specified period of time. So we'll just take a quick look at that. And I've got that module installed here just to, show you what it looks like. Um, the IIS 7 interface is again completely redesigned, the management interface. Um, there's actually, you can't even manage an IIS 6 or previous machine from this uh, console. So they've got the legacy console uh, that comes with, with the new windows as well as the new one which is meant just for managing IIS 7 installs. But if you go to any of the websites, um, you basically have a bunch of options uh, here and I've installed the dynamic IP address and domain restrictions module. So I've got that option here. And when I click on it, there's a uh, option to edit the feature settings. Um, so by default, we'll say we want to allow um, all clients. And then we're going to go ahead and edit our dynamic restriction rules. And the resolution's kind of small here, so I apologize. But essentially, we can say, we want to deny IP address based on the number of concurrent requests, or we can deny them based on the number of requests over a period of time. So what I've done here is I've defined a policy that says if somebody issues more than 240 requests within a 60 second time period, let's block them for one minute. So specifically what I'm trying to do, and you can see the action down here, um, you can return a forbidden and not found. I'm just going to go ahead and abort the connection and close it. So. What we're trying to do here is really thwart some type of a CGI or a application scan that's usually going to issue at least four requests a second, uh, if not more. You can even lower this realistically to six, you know, one request every second for a minute, and that's probably more than, uh, than anyone's normally going to, to issue. So just to sort of demo this, let me go into, uh, we've got uh, Nikto, which is a uh, CGI scanner. So I'm going to go ahead and launch a Nikto scan against our, and just to show you here before we get started, this is the uh, Battle Blog, which is the name of that ASP application. This is the default site that we're going to be working with. So I've got a virtual host here, www.battleblog.test. And oops. so you can see the site works normally. I'm going to go ahead and launch a scan against the site. So you can see it's already detected the server. It's coming back and letting me know that there's some methods that are allowed. It's warning me about cross-site tracing. It's also telling me that there's an X powered by header. And the scan has completed. So what we can do here now is if I go over to my show blocked IP addresses list, the local host is now on this list because we just violated that threshold and Nikto probably didn't realize it, but about midway, if not sooner, through, their, through the scan, we got blocked. So if I were to actually just rerun the exact same scan right now, you'll see that it actually comes back and says no web server found on local host and that's because the server is just denying our request. And I can even go here and try and refresh the page and I'm, I'm, I've got burp running because we're going to do some demos later with burp. But you can see it's giving me a timeout uh, communicating with the server and that's because the server basically just shut down the connection when I tried to uh, connect to it. So 
as you can see, it's pretty useful for slowing down or thwarting some automated attacks against the, uh, the application. Certainly, this isn't something we want to rely on as far as being like our only defense, but um, making the attacker's life a little more difficult to slow down these scans is always uh, a good thing. So we'll go ahead and remove or add this to our uh, allow list now, and we should be then allowed back into the site. So that's just a quick example or demo for, uh, for that module. The, and that's pretty much all it does. It's a pretty simple module, but it's pretty nice functionality. Uh, the next one I want to talk about is the URL rewriter for IIS 7. And this is a really cool one that it's amazing it took this long for IIS to, or for Microsoft to even come out with this. But essentially, this is mod rewrite for IIS. Uh, there's been a mod rewrite for IIS for years now that's an ISAPI module that uh, is a commercial product. I think there's a freeware version of it. Um, but Microsoft finally built their own. And this allows you to do pretty much the same type of stuff you can do with mod rewrite on Apache. So again, it's called on begin request because it's one of the first hooks that we want to make on a given request. And unlike the, U the URL filtering or request filtering module, the rewrite module actually does support regular expressions and also allows us to access the different server variables. So it's going to allow us to do some much more flexible stuff than, uh, than the request filtering module. And again, the, the intention here is not for security, but I'm going to show you how you can sort of write some rewrite rules that will allow you to enforce certain security, at least over GET requests. Now, the, the caveat here is that um, it, the rewrite module only applies to GET requests. It only looks at the query string and the URI. So it's, I'm not going to, I shouldn't say it only applies to GET requests. It only looks at the query string and the URI. It's not going to look at post data. So if we're worried about post level attacks, uh, there's not much we can do with this. But we can certainly block access to certain URLs and even do some, some rudimentary, some basic query string validation, as we'll see here in a second, using uh, this module. So going back to the, um, the sample application here in our, ma in our management console, I've got another icon for the URL rewrite module here. And I've got two requests, uh, two rules already defined that, I, that, I, that are just disabled right now that I'll enable real quick. But before we do that, I'll just point out a vulnerability here within the, uh, the sample application. And that is that if we go to the comment page, which is uh, comment.asp, we'll see there's an entry equals six in the query string. Um, and as you can imagine, you stick a, a single quote in here, and we get an ugly database error. So this is a clear SQL injection vulnerability where they're not validating that input parameter. So what we want to do is we want to go ahead and try and figure out if there's some rewrite rules we can use to prevent this type of attack. So if I go into the first rule here that I've already defined, it's, I called it drop invalid comment request. Essentially, what it's going to do is, the first thing you do is you match a URL pattern. And you can do this as just a static URL or a uh, regular expression. I don't really need a regex here, but we're using it anyways. And my pattern is simply just the, the name of the file, comment.asp. So, so what's going to happen here is this rule is going to match when the URI is equal to or contains the string comment.asp. I'm going to ignore the case. And then, depending on, I've got some match conditions that I define here. And depending on whether they match or whether they don't match, I can then perform some actions. So I'm going to say um, match any, which means, and I've only got one, so it doesn't really matter. You can do match all or match any. We'll see that a little bit later where it comes into play. But I'm going to say if the query string server variables, anything in brackets here relates to a server variable. And you can see here on the, just for reference, I've got the reference page for the module set up here. These are all the different server variables that you can actually reference from within a rewrite rule. So again, if you're familiar with mod rewrite on Apache, it's very similar. You can look at basically any part of the request to, to make your rule. And what we're going to do here is I'm going to say if it does not match the following pattern, uh, my action is going to be abort the request or deny the, the connection. And my pattern is simply entry equals and then a numeric value. And you can see I've got it anchored on both sides there. So if the query, this is a page. And again, this all just comes down to knowing what our application is supposed to expect. This comment.asp page always has to be called with an entry um, parameter here. So if I call it with a blank one, you can see I just get another database error that's not necessarily because of my bad input. It's just missing a value. But 
Um, so what my rule has done here is it's basically going to say if it doesn't match entry equals with a number, abort the request. So I'm going to go back and enable this. And I'll refresh. You can see that it still works. And now if I put in a single quote here, you can see I get the same type of response that I got before, which is that the server is just closing down the connection. And it doesn't have to be a single quote. Basically, anything other than a number in here is going to cause the request to fail. Uh, however, if I do pass a number in, it's going to allow the request through. Now again, this only works because it's in the query string. If this, was, if this, if this page supports the same parameter going over a post, this rule may not apply. Um, well, it actually would apply because I defined it where it needs to have this, this query string value. But typically speaking, you're not going to use these rewrite rules to validate uh, pages that accept data over a post, as I mentioned before. The, um, the other thing we've got in here is that if we go to the web root of this application, and I should have a window here that's already pulled up. You can see there's um, a bunch of stuff. There's like a test.asp page, for example, in here. Um, and let's just see what that does. Essentially, that just uh, redirects us back to display.asp. But you can see if I request that here, um, it's basically just a link back to the display page. So this is a test page. It doesn't really do much. But in general, one of the big problems you'll typically have is that there's garbage in the web route that developers leave over time that ultimately can get called by a user, potentially creating a security issue. So another thing we can do with the rewrite rules is we can basically just create a rule that has a list of the files that we do know users are supposed to call. And if, it, if the request doesn't match one of those files, send either, you know, again, forbidden error or close down the connection or what have you. So what I've done here is basically just ran through and I said for, uh, I've got, there's a couple ways we can do this. I can say if the URI matches and specifically specify the pattern for the URI, which is what I've done with the comment page, or I can even just say uh, if I can reference the request file name variable, which is going to be the full local path to the file name. Uh, really just two different ways of doing the same thing. Um, and again, because these are regular expressions, I don't have to write one for every single file. I can just do this approach here, which basically says if it's not article, ballot process, ballot send, comment, um, comment preview, display, index, preview, vote. If it's not on this list of ASP files, uh, my default action is going to be abort request. And of course, there's more than just ASP pages here. So I allowed images, so any GIF file within the images folder. And then there's a CSS file we've got under admin custom. So basically, if the request doesn't match any of these rules, and that's why I've got the, um, this should be match any, it's going to fail the request. So if we go back to our application here, um, let me click on the comment page. That still works. And then now let's try and request test.asp. Just refresh. And it's still working. So let's go back and see what happened here. I think I forgot to enable the rule. That's what happened. So we've got the rule. Let me just select Enable Rule. And now that should be enabled. And you can see that my request to test.asp uh, does not work. Um, and it looks like this, this rule broke as well. Let me just disable this. I just wrote these rules this morning, so it's still in test mode. Um, well, there's clearly a problem with the rule here. Uh, as I said before, whenever you do demos, whatever can go wrong will go wrong. Um, so we won't spend too much time matching. Oh, here it is. It's, it's still matching on um, any. It should have been match all. So essentially what's going to happen is if it doesn't match any of these, which means it matches all of does not match, does not match, does not match, it's going to then forbid the request. So let me just reapply that here. So we can see it's working. Um, and if I go back to the test page, that one's getting forbidden. So essentially anything that's not on our whitelist of authorized URLs is going to be restricted.
So those are just two basic examples of how you can use the rewrite module for security. Again, not really the granularity that we'd want or need, but certainly for certain situations, certain scenarios could come in handy. Um, so that's the demo we just did. The interesting thing is if you compare this module to the request filter module, I mentioned before that the rewrite module has a lot of cool features and capabilities that the request filtering module doesn't. But by that same token, you can see that the request filtering module does a lot of stuff that the rewrite module can't. Um, there's really, other than being able to check for uh, the HTTP verbs, uh, they each do things that the other does not. Um, and the other thing is, w w the first item there, scanning the URL path, clearly the regex capabilities is better than the substring that request filtering has. But as far as checking max length of the, um, the query string or the, uh, the content length and so forth, uh, that's something that you're only going to be able to do with request filtering. So certainly there's good use for both of these here. And there's just a little footnote there that there's another module, the IP restriction module that we talked about that can be used to block IP addresses. Um, you can also do that with rewrite. So the final um, Microsoft module that I want to talk about is the application request routing module. Again, this is basically mod proxy for IIS 7. So what this allows you to do is create a reverse proxy with IIS 7, and you can then start doing cool stuff like filtering any URLs or bolting using .NET authentication, anything like that, based on your different URL rules. So it allows you to basically now use IIS 7 to protect um, another application that may be running on some custom web server or, or who knows internally or even just on a different IIS box internally and you want to create some type of an application gateway. So this can certainly be a good thing uh, for security and can also just be a cool thing functionality wise allowing you to then publish internal apps through a uh, reverse proxy. And, and again, it just supports load balancing, client affinity, that type of stuff. So the really cool stuff that you can do with IIS 7 in addition to all the new modules is you can write your own module. And the beautiful thing about that is that there's no limit to what you can do. So the concept, as I mentioned before, of ASP.NET modules is not new. It's been around for a while now. Um, the difference here is that our, our, our modules can now intercept and, and handle requests for any content on IIS 7. And an ASP.NET module is basically just a .NET class that implements the uh, IHTTP module interface. Uh, you can write it in any, any managed language you want. Uh, you can also write these modules, uh, as I mentioned before, which is what most of the ones that come with the web server are in, uh, in C++. Um, but certainly most of them uh, that are already out there because people have been writing these for years are, are written in .NET. So the, 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 the the inspiration for a lot of the features or basically just doing all of this stuff with a module here came from an article that was in MSDN back in 2007. Uh, Mike Volodarsky, who's the, the program manager for the IIS 7 team, and I believe even also the ASP.NET, um, or at least the, the team within ASP.NET that handles the, the request pipeline, he always is coming out with cool stuff that you can do and basically just showcasing all the different stuff you can do with, with IIS 7. So what he did was he wrote an article where he took a PHP application called QDIG, which is just an open source gallery type module, and he basically bolted on a lot of additional functionality and features to it and enhanced it using a managed module and leveraging the IIS 7 pipeline. So what he did was he, he added authentication using .NET Forms authentication. So he wrote his own custom login page, defined all the authentication roles and, and, and permissions within the web config. And because now all of those permissions apply to, or all those, the request filters apply to PHP or any other app as well, he was able to enforce role-based authentication on his gallery. Um, he also did some cool search engine friendly URL rewriting. Uh, and the nice thing is not only was he rewriting the requests inbound, which has been done um, for a while now, but he also was transforming the requests on the way out as well. So the PHP app was actually writing the old clunky query string URLs. He was actually on the fly as they were being generated out, rewriting them to match the search engine friendly patterns that he had defined. And then the other thing he did was he added um, output caching to speed up performance. So he used the ASP.NET output cache to start caching images that were being served by these PHP pages. So he did a lot of cool stuff and it got me thinking, you know, there's a lot of stuff from an application security perspective that you could do, you know, aside from, from authentication. 
that, that is really perfect for this type of scenario. So I was talking with some folks and we had the idea for building this application security module for IIS 7. And the idea was that if we had access to all these different events, we could parse the request, we could parse the response, we could keep track of all the data that's going in and out. So not only could we do some data validation like known, sig known bad signatures that, that most of your WAFs out there already do and just kind of a blacklist, we could also do a little more intelligent authorization level defense mechanism because we know what the application is presenting to the user and in theory, you know, the user shouldn't, unless there's a, a login page, an entry point, um, the user should only be following links and forms and so forth that the application renders. So our thought was let's leverage response analysis using a module to figure out what the user should be able to do and only let them do that. So the concept is, is pretty simple in theory. We, we basically look at every response and say, okay, what options are, is the application presenting to the user? And if the option is not on the page, then let's not let the user access it. Typically, the application is only going to present users with links to stuff they're, they should be able to do. Um, as we all know from a security perspective, it's very common that you have uh, hidden links and security through obscurity that allows you to do stuff you shouldn't be able to do. So the goal here was to try and prevent that type of scenario from occurring. So the end product of that was what we ended up calling Secure Parameter Filter, SPF, for IIS 7. And essentially, the nice thing is it's not just for IIS 7. It works on IIS 6 as well. Uh, the difference is on IIS 6, it only works on .NET applications versus on IIS 7, it works on across the board. And essentially what it, the, the goal is, it's, it tries to prevent um, non-editable data, so pre-populated form inputs like hidden fields, drop-down lists, et cetera, from being manipulated by the user. Um, and it also tries to figure out or prevent the user from accessing resources they haven't been specifically linked to. And the way it does that, as we'll walk through here in a second, is a combination of output tracking and output response parsing, as well as request validation on the way back in. This is a free module. Uh, it's actually available for download on the URL up there on our website. Um, so feel free to download it and play around with it. And essentially it has two main pieces. And uh, a, a lot of this inspiration also came from another project out there that's been around for a couple years called uh, HDiv. Is anybody familiar with HDiv or heard of HDiv at all? So HDiv essentially is a Java filter. It's, it's, a, it's a set of custom tag libs that work with struts and spring. And what it does is essentially it tries to do the same exact thing we're doing here, where they override all the tag libs so that every form input, every link that gets rendered out, they add a token to it. And that token is tied directly to the user for which it was rendered. So without a token, you can't access any resource. And a user can only access resources with tokens that they've been provided. And those tokens are actually tied to every resource. So we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll go through that. It'll, it'll become a little more evident what I'm talking about here, because we pretty much try and do the same thing with this module. But the way it works is there's a response filter, and that analyzes the HTML on the way out, and it looks for URLs, any form data, cookies, and then JavaScript functions as well. And we'll talk about why it's looking at JavaScript uh, later on. And what it tries to do is figure out for every single form what the state of the form is. So what are the inputs associated with that form, and what state are they in? Are they editable? Are they read-only? Um, are they hidden, in which case they're pretty much read-only? And then what it does is it tries to then, co it, it correlates that back to the user that requested the response with a token value and those inputs are only going to be allowed back in along with that token provided that it's the same user. So the request filter essentially does that. It looks at every request and figures out is this authorized based on the tokens or unique IDs that it issues uh, on the way out. And the only thing that you can get to without a token, because you, you need to start somewhere, is the entry point, which is typically the default landing page or the login page for the application. And as a catch-all, it also has a blacklist that applies to post, get, uh, cookies, all that stuff, depending on uh, how you configure it, just to, as, as a catch-all, because these tokens are only going to prevent, like I said before, the non-editable inputs. So a freeform text box that says, please enter your comment here, um, there's no way for the module to know what type of data is going to be in there. So to, for that scenario, you've got a blacklist that you can define some, some known bad patterns.
So going back to the pipeline, there's three specific events that we're hooking into. Uh, the first is the begin request event, which is for validating the request. And then on the way out, we're going to look at the, uh, we're going to parse the response on the released request state event. Um, by then, the handler has already generated all the HTML. And then we're going to also look at the request on the end request to make sure nothing's happened between release request state and end request. Um, specifically, there's sometimes cookies that are added uh, between there by the .NET framework. So we do all of our cookie parsing on end request. So the module itself is very easy to install. It's like any other module. Um, and, and something I did sort of skip over before that I'll just cover real quick here is I mentioned before all of the configuration in IIS 7 has been moved into .config files. So the web.config for the Battleblog ASP site, as you can see here, has our rewrite rules in here. So the nice thing is that any of the modules that you want to configure, all the web server settings, you can do that in your config file. And as a developer, you can push that out with your app. You don't need to have access like you did before to the IIS 7 management console or IIS 6 management console to lock down what types of files are served and so forth. It's all done via config. So as a developer, it's going to give you a lot more control over the web server configuration when your app gets pushed out. Now, clearly, there are ways for the global machine config to override your settings and so forth. So this isn't necessarily foolproof, but you do have the option of, of at least surrendering, or administrators have the option of surrendering that level of control to the uh, developers. So going back to the module, modules are, are, are all pretty easy to install. Essentially, there's a module section within a web.config, and you just basically define the name of the module. So we've added our um, is.spf.core module as the type. The name of it is ISPF. And we're just adding one here. So um, whatever modules were already configured at the server level, we're just adding one. We could easily remove other ones here. Um, we could re-specify re all the modules, but we're just going to, uh, to add one. And notice here that I'm just going to say run all managed modules for all requests. And that's basically what's going to allow my managed module, which is written in .NET code, to apply to unmanaged requests like ASP, for example, or PHP. So all you got to do is add, a, add the module. Then we've got a custom configuration section for the module that really just defines the different uh, configuration settings that the module needs to operate. And there's just some very basic settings that we need to put in here. Specifically, there's a log file directory. Um, and then you just have to tell it what you want to protect. So we're going to say protect form. There's basically just got to specify form, values, form state, query string, cookies. We'll, we'll get into all this stuff as we go on. But basically, I've set everything to true. And I've said that only protect ASP files. So once we've done that, um, the module pretty much is running. And the first demo that we're going to do is, sorry, failure to restrict URL access. So as I mentioned before, the battle blog application has a bunch of flaws in it. One of them is that it's got an admin upload page that's just sitting behind the admin folder that's not linked from anywhere. Um, once you, but once you're authenticated as an admin, they give you a link to it. And if you know it's back there, you can call it anonymously. So just to demo that real quick, if we go back to, uh, let me just make sure our rule was removed that prevents me from requesting anything on our whitelist. Otherwise, this won't work. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is show you the actual page. Um, it's basically called uploadform.asp. You can see I'm not logged in as an admin. Um, and all you've got to do here, as you would imagine, is browse for a local file. And it'll go ahead and uh, you can upload anything to the uploads folder. It's a pretty bad vulnerability, especially considering you can upload ASP files um, and start executing them. So what we want to do is we want to prevent somebody from finding this page and linking to it. So if we go, we've got another virtual host running another instance of the battle blog application that's called spf.battleblog.test up there in the URL. And essentially, that instance is protected with SPF. So I can see here that when I go to the administration page, for example, or any page, I've got a URL token in the query string here. And essentially, what that URL token is, is if I've got a slide that sort of outlines what's happening here. There's a cryptographic token that's appended to every single request that gets generated by the app. And the reason for that is it's going to verify if there's any query string values in there. It'll make sure that those haven't been tampered with. And it'll also make sure that I'm authorized to access the URL itself. So the way it works is if we've got the application 
on the right, and, the, and, and it's going to generate links to the user. It generates a link, let's say, to showarticles.aspx, and it's got an article ID in there. So what SPF is going to do is it's going to say, okay, I'm going to add a URL token to the end of that, that link, and that URL token essentially includes two pieces. The first is a timestamp, so we can configure a, a timeout for any link. So if the link goes stale, the user's not going to be able to click on it. And then the last piece is basically just a SHA-1 HMAC of the following pieces of data. The URL, the query string, the timestamp, so we make sure they didn't edit the timestamp. And then every, every time there's a new request issued to SPF, it'll send you a session cookie that's almost like a session ID um, that's just a random GUID that it generates. And that cookie is also included when it calculates this SHA-1 HMAC along with your source IP address. So when the request comes back in, SPF is going to say, OK, you're asking for this page. Let me pull your token and let me recalculate the HMAC. If it fails, it's not going to let you in. And there's really no way for someone to figure out what this HMAC is going to be um, unless they have access to not only the, the, the machine key, which is the ASP.NET machine key that we're using to generate the HMAC, and all of these different values. So practically speaking, if the app isn't rendering you a link to a page, there's really no way for you to request it. So as we can see here, um, anything that the app links me to, um, like the comment page, for example, my URL token is there. If I take the URL token out, I'm going to get a forbidden error. And this is a, we've got detailed errors turned on here. So you can see here that I've got an invalid parameter name of entry. And that's because there's, there's no token on there. Um, so it's immediately failing the validation step. So if I try to access the admin page that we had just seen a few minutes ago, which was upload form, I believe. Let's do admin. Uh, same thing, missing token. So there's really no way for me to get to anything that the app doesn't specifically link me to. So this is going to prevent not only query string manipulation, um, but also just forced browsing attacks, as we see here. Um, so after the SPF module has, has rewritten that link, it's going to send it back out to the user. And um, on the way back in, it's going to validate it, as we saw. Now, the nice thing is that there's an added bonus where we also get some cross-site request forgery protection here as well. Because if I don't have that token, again, is tied directly to a cookie that's issued to me. So somebody can't force me to make a request to any page unless they have the right token. And unless they have access to my session cookie, there's no way for them to calculate that as well. So the nice thing is, is if we do have CSRF attacks, and we do have one here, I'm not going to demo it, but the add user form isn't tokenized whatsoever if you're an admin, um, there's no way for us to be vulnerable to cross-site request forgery because an attacker is not going to have access to that cryptographic token. And again, the key part here is that even if they have an authenticated session, their session cookie is going to be different than my session cookie. So there's no way that they're going to be able to convince the, the server to issue them a token that, that, that's going to be accepted for me. Does that make sense? So I mentioned before there's several other vulnerabilities here. Um, the next one is SQL injection that we already saw in the query string, but specifically that issue is also exploitable via post request as well. And the way SPF protects forms is a little bit different. Um, it has two methods of form protection. The first is form state, which records the different inputs that are associated with a form, as well as whether they're editable or not. And then the other protection is the value itself. So we have the option of masking values, hidden values, so that the user can't see them. And when we talk about editable versus non-editable, we're talking about things like hidden hidden fields, radio boxes, check boxes, et cetera, which are typically read only. So just to give you an example of how that would work, um, let's say we have this form here. Uh, it posts to the search page, um, and then it's got a text input box, and then a bunch of other what we'll consider non-editable inputs. So what SPF is going to do is it's going to record form state information for this form. Specifically, that's going to include the action, so where the form posts to, 
the owner, which is going to be that session cookie that I talked about earlier. So we always have a session cookie once we're talking to the server. It's going to record me as being the owner of this form. It's then going to assign a unique form identifier to the form. And again, that's just another GUID. And it's going to insert this as an extra hidden field in the form. And then it's going to run through and actually record all the different non-editable or all the different inputs and say whether they're editable or not. So we can see that the query input is editable, so we don't have a value for it. And on the way back in, we're going to allow anything through there as long as it's, uh, as long as it's an input name of query. And then for the other ones, we're only going to allow, since they're non-editable, the values that, w that were pre-populated in there. And I mentioned before that it not only has the ability to prevent you from altering it, but also prevents us from seeing them as well. So you can see that it's going to replace on the way out um, the different values with essentially just the array position within their respective arrays of that value. So there's only one value for all of those items except for uh, scope, which has two. So you can see there's two scope items, a one and a two. So let's go ahead and see how that looks when we actually access the application. Um, I mentioned before, this is the request, this is the, the version that's not protected. So if I go to, um, let's say I want to go to um, the politics category. I'm going to use burp to intercept this since it's a post request and you're not going to be able to see it easily. Um, so when I go and make the post request, you can see there's two inputs. There's a category equals general and an order equals comments. So if I stick a single quote, for example, in one of those and I forward on the request, um, it's actually going to generate a SQL Server error down here, which indicates that that value is vulnerable to SQL injection. So if we actually contrast that now to the version that is protected with SPF, let me forward that response on, and I'll go to the SPF version of this page, and I'll just forward this request. So I'll do the same thing. I'll say let's sort by score and politics, and I hit the go button. This request is much different. You can see now I've got the form token, which again references that form state information that's stored on the server, and then I've got category equals three and order equals two. So there's a few interesting things here. The first is that because I recorded that form state and there's only two possible inputs, I can't add a third value called, you know, and foo equals bar because that input was not included on in the original form. So it's not going to be in the form state that's associated with that token. The other thing is I can only substitute valid values here that correspond to values that were recorded on the way out. So I really have no way of manipulating or editing these values other than to va other values that were originally presented to me. So even if I change this to five, which I don't think there were five order values there. Um, you can see that I got rejected and it says missing token order and that's because that value was not, uh, was basically manipulated and it wasn't found in the lookup table on the way back in. So what, what SPF is doing is it's just taking those, the, the ex exact same substitution that we did on the way out. It's just undoing it on the way back in. So from the application's perspective, once it does go through, if I actually just reissue that exact same request and I don't change anything, you can see that it works. And it says I'm, you know, now lets me know I'm in filtered mode. There's just, there's nothing under politics. Um, so we can do it like general. And you can see that, so to the underlying application, there's nothing's been changed in the ASP code. It doesn't even know that this substitution occurred. It's all happening um, on the fly as the data's going out and then it's all being undone on the fly on the way back in. So, Another nice thing that, w that, that comes along with the fact that we're substituting these values on the way back out is that we're protecting them from being disclosed to the user. So another silly thing that this app does, um, and again, this is just a great app for doing these demos because this is all just stuff that's built right into it, um, is when you go to make a comment, they've actually got a CAPTCHA. Um, let me turn intercept off. And if I go to generate a comment, you'll see that there's a, uh, a CAPTCHA that says, you know, please type in the word, what have you. And if I actually do a view source, there's a hidden input called security word with the actual value of the security word. 
So this is clearly going to be an ineffective capture mechanism because any bot that's trying to spam this thing is going to have access to the value itself. So, so this is really just a, a, a silly thing that the app is doing. If we actually take a look at the version that's protected with SPF, because it's masking, because it's substituting all those inputs on the way out, the same page, if I go to view source and I look for a security word, security word equals one. And again, that's because the data itself is being stored uh, in, the, in the form state and not being sent out to the user. So it also prevents the user from viewing this data, which in this type of scenario is very valuable. The other nice thing as a, as a side benefit is that it also reduces, if we think about view state, for example, view state is huge and oftentimes can be, uh, you know, it can even start impacting performance because it's a huge amount of data, even doubling the size of the requests going in and out. Um, this same concept can be used to store the view state on the server as well. So it'll just say view state equals one, and um, it'll even decrease the level of bandwidth that you need to do your requests and responses. So there's some other, some nice non-security benefits that you have here as well. Um, now the final thing I want to talk about with SPF is the JavaScript protection. And this is something that originally we hadn't even thought of, and, and this is something that actually HDiv doesn't do. Um, but we quickly realized the need to do it. And that is that these days, every application uses JavaScript. And it's very often that JavaScript functions are actually used to send data in and out of, uh, or basically issue requests to the, the server. So there's a few variants that this can take on. And, and this is really even just basic JavaScript. We're not even talking about intense AJAX stuff here. Um, the first is, if you want to just do a link, instead of doing an href, you can just have a JavaScript uh, function that when you click on it does a window.location or a location.href. So uh, SPF automatically treats, anytime it finds a, window a call to window.location or location.href, it treats the, the value that's being passed in as a URL. So it's going to protect that the same way it would protect an ahref tag. The more interesting one, though, is for JavaScript functions, that actually have, are used to generate uh, a request to the server. Specifically, the one that comes to mind in the .NET world that you can't get away from is the do postback function. So let's take a quick look at how we can handle this situation. Essentially, the JavaScript function do postback, which is a standard .NET function that's in every, every application, uh, takes in two values, the event target and the event argument. And those two values that are passed in when you, when you click on a link that calls do postback, essentially it takes those two values, assigns them to those two form inputs. So the, the form has an input called double underscore event target and double underscore event argument. It'll populate those two hidden inputs with that value and submit the form. So this causes a problem for the way we're doing things in SPF because on the way out, those hidden inputs had no value. So on the way back in, they're coming back in with a value that was assigned via JavaScript that we didn't know about because it wasn't even in the form block. So to compensate for this, we figured out, OK, what, val what do we need to know about here in order to, pr to, to make this work? So specifically, if we can identify what the function name is that's doing this, the different arguments to that function and whether they're actually going to be used as a form input or, or, or not, and then where they're being assigned, then we can easily figure out a way to allow those values back in when we're parsing that response. So what we do is we have a, uh, and this is the one thing, everything else that I've described so far does not require any customization. It's all done on the fly. This is the one thing that you'll have to configure if you're using JavaScript to perform requests uh, because there's no way that, that the, uh, again, barring us building some type of a JavaScript interpreter, um, there's no way for us to know what functions are doing this. So what we've done is we've defined a, a manual configuration entry called script protection that basically just says, okay, give me the function name and give me all the arguments to that function and just tell me whether or not to protect them. And um, if, if I do need to protect them, tell me whether uh, the name of the input that it's going to be assigned to. Um, you don't need to have the name of the input that it's assigned to, but as we'll see in a minute, it makes it a little more secure if you can do that. And essentially what we're going to do is we parse this data on the way out and we protect these values. Rather than using the substitution mechanism like we used before, we actually just encrypt them and we decrypt them on the way back out. 
So let's use an example here. We've got, we know, as, as we mentioned here, we know that there's going to be a function called do postback with two inputs, and the first is going to be assigned to the event target input. The second is going to be defined to, defined to the event argument input. So here's the actual JavaScript function call. We're going to go ahead and transform that to, uh, to this, which looks like gibberish. But essentially what this is is we'll just use, you can see there's actually two, the same two, call, there's two arguments here. Um, we're just going to look at the second one, but essentially the same thing happened, the, the very similar process was used to protect the first one. So the input is just three pieces of data that are all separated by a colon. So each argument value has been separated uh, or has been replaced with these three inputs that are colon delimited. And the first is just a base64 encoded representation of the encrypted input value. And we encrypt it with the default ASP.NET machine key as well. We don't want to have to worry about key management. Um, and we also include some, some random, uh, random eight bytes at the beginning of it that are sort of like a pseudo IV, the, um, uh, just so, we, so that every single input encrypts to something unique. The second piece of data is a timestamp. Again, we don't want these things to be valid forever, just like the links. So we expire them after a predetermined set of time. You can always set this to zero, in which case it'll never expire. And then, just like on the links, we generate a token. And that token covers the integrity of the ciphertext to make sure no one, no one messed with it, the timestamp to make sure it hasn't been altered, and then we tie that to the session cookie, which is that GUID, the source IP address, and then optionally, the input name and the target URL if we have that information. So we do have the input name here, which is event target and event argument. And the reason we do that is we want to prevent somebody from taking these two values and swapping them out so that even if they can't directly manipulate one or the other, they can take the value from one and place it into the value of the other. So by including the input, the, the input name within the HMAC, we basically bind that, site, that token to that input name so you can't do substitution. Um, we're running out of time. I did have a, a demo of that on a .NET app, but we don't have time for that. Um, there is, I will say, there is a, a uh, not only is this app available for download, we have a public site that runs a, an application called .NET Stock Trader, which is an MSDN sample app, and we've got two instance, uh, is a, instances of it running, one that is protected with SPF, one that is not. So you can actually toy around with it live on our, uh, on our test site if you want to sort of play with it and see it in action. But briefly, just to, as I mentioned before, the configuration options here are minimal. It sort of takes the same approach as the, um, the allow and deny stuff on the, uh, the .NET settings, which is you define the default, which is, say, protect everything. And then if there are certain exceptions you need to make, so maybe there's one page that is doing something so convoluted that we can't possibly figure out a way for SPF to protect.